You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 1st, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, evaluation of hypereosinophilia. Our presenter is Dr. Javed Sheikh. He's the co-director of the Allergy Immunology Fellowship Program at Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles, California. All right, thank you. And uh, you guys should be able to see my slides, right? I'll move, Perfect. move to dis disclosures. Everything working? Good. Um, yeah, so um, this talk will be quite clinical. Um, we won't go through too much science, but mostly focus on clinical aspects. And try, uh, I've tried to make it, make it really practical so that it'll be most useful for uh, seeing patients and evaluating patients with uh, eosinophilia and going through their workups, differential diagnosis, and so forth. And so um, disclosure-wise, the only thing potentially relevant would be um, research support to, the, to my institution. This was in the past, some years ago. Um, I was site PI for study of mepolizumab IV for hyperosinophilic syndromes, and, and we will discuss the drug a little bit. Okay, so I said it would be very clinical, so we'll just do a slide or two of uh, of cellular biology just to introduce the topic and just a couple buzzwords for the for the um, for your boards and so forth and uh, let's see I can probably do pointer here uh, well you can see my cursor right uh, correct that'll work so yeah we'll just go with that uh, then so the eosinophil is, it's a myeloid cell, so keep that in mind. It comes from the myeloid uh, lineage of cells. So what drives eosinophils and differentiates them? IL-3, GMCSF, as for all of the, mylo uh, the myeloid cells. And then also third cytokine, IL-5, is a critical cytokine that will help the eosinophil to differentiate itself and separate itself from basophils and neutrophils. So those, those are the three granulocytes, right, that come out of the, the myeloid lineage um, of the white cells. So we'll talk about the eosinophil cell and what, what we do when it's high and what the diseases might be. All right, and moving, let's see. There we go, there's the, oh, there's the arrow, all right. So yeah, the eosinophil then, characteristically, it's a cell that stains nicely if you use the H and E staining, um, which is a common stain for blood smears, then the eosinophil stains very well with eosin, uh, pink to red color, and hence the name eosinophil. And so here's a cell you can see staining nicely with uh, eosin on the H and E uh, stain. It characteristically has a bilobed nuclei, at least for normal cells. Sometimes when they're abnormal, you don't see that, but you can see this two, two lobes to the nucleus. So if you have a board question with this, this is an eosinophil. And you can see the cytoplasm stains in a normal cell. There'll be uniform granules scattered around throughout the cell. And they also stain uh, with the eosinophil stain, as you, uh, the eosin stain, as you can see. So that's a pretty normal looking cell there. So when is it high in the blood count? What's considered eosinophilia or elevated eosinophil count? So one clinical pearl is we don't want to focus on the percent too much because that can mislead us, even though um, a lot of times our primary teams will quote us the eosinophils in percent on the CBC with diff, and some of the printouts primarily just give you the percent. But always count out, uh, calculate out a total eosinophil count then, right? So, so your white WBCs get reported out in cells per microliter, uh, quantitatively, right? And then you have a percent eosinophil. And if your lab doesn't already calculate it, you can just take the percent times the white blood count. And then that'll give you your total eosinophil count in cells per microliter, which is really what you want to use to assess then what's normal. So generally, the experts will say that normal is um, below 500 eosinophils per 
microliter. Some labs will use 450. Really depends what population was chosen to be to be studied. Um, so you might get a flag of 450 in some labs as an abnormal. Um, 500 is fine to consider as well. So then anything above that could be considered a, an abnormal. And then, you know, we have to remember these are all bell curves, right, when we look at lab abnormals. Um, so we're looking at a population and, uh, you know, if you take if you take 90 percentile, that's normal range, you'll have 5 percent on either end that may be low or high. And so it doesn't necessarily mean these people have pathology, it just means they're off the bell curve, right? And so we want to consider that too, but the higher you get up the bell curve, the more likely in general that something is going on. So, so the criteria then, the consensus criteria is that mild eosinophilia would be from 500 to 1500. Um, so you'll see a kind of a theme of 1500 being a key element uh, being considered in many definitions. Then if you go above 1,500, that becomes moderate eosinophilia. For sure, above 1,500 is what's really considered hyper eosinophilia, if you want to use that term. So high blood levels of EOs, 1,500 and up. Um, somewhat arbitrary, but 1,500 then to 5,000 is moderate and severe, 5,000 and higher. There's not necessarily anything magic about about that 5,000 number. That's just uh, kind of an expert consensus to to cut it off. So key point would be then 500 and lower is normal, 1500 and up is hyper eosinophilia. PCPs always ask us, you know, when they should refer, so we should know that too. When should they refer patients, whether it's inpatient or outpatient or, or to touch base with us? So we do know that, well, many of those, you know, people in that 5% range 500 to 1,500 of mild eosinophilia, probably many of those are benign. So if a patient has a routine allergic disease and they have EOs above 500 but, but lower than 1,500, we know that's relatively common, right? When we see our asthmatics, if we do uh, their eosinophil counts, we'll see, we may see that. In fact, now we use that to help to phenotype them out as far as our asthma treatments, right? So we know asthmatics can run 500 to 1,500, and that's considered generally fine and within their, their disease. Atopic dermatitis, for example, as well, may run in that uh, range too. Sometimes allergic rhin rhinitis or rhinosinusitis, or particularly if there's a significant uh, ATP involved, right, we, we may see that uh, occur too. So they probably don't need to re refer if there is a routine allergic disease with a little bit of eosinophilia, but less than 1,500. Um, if they do refer, this really varies based on institution to institution. You know, certainly we should be prepared at least to evaluate patients um, who do come our way with elevated eosinophil. So many centers, the allergy immunology specialist is going to be the point person, whether it's for adults or peds or both. Um, some centers, the, the primary referral might go to a hematologist, particularly on the uh, adult side of things. And uh, sometimes we may need them involved in our workup as well. Um, ID might be involved. Certainly if there's suspicion of parasitic disease that needs treatment, they might uh, be involved and we might want their help in picking out a treatment agent. But some patients may need a combination of, uh, of specialists and a team approach to their workup and treatment. Okay, so we got the patient referred by the PCP into allergy. How do we look at their workup? So, of course, as for anything, we want to be good uh, clinicians and diagnosticians. And for eosinophilia, though, particularly, this is important. History, getting the right historical factors is important. Um, if you have a whole body involvement, potentially, then a good physical exam, thorough exam, is uh, going to be useful. And, and a good complete review of systems in these cases is often going to be um, useful. So. We often want to be fairly comprehensive in our evaluations then for these patients. And then we'll tailor our diagnostic studies that I'll outline um, depending what we find. So what do we look for in our histories with the eosinophilic patients? And these are some of the key things to, to add in onto your history. So as we said, certainly allergic disease can be a cause in of itself. So we want to ask about their history of allergic diseases, we usually do in our clinics. 
Um, we particularly want to think about drug reactions that can be relatively common for eosinophilia. So we do want a careful medication history. Many medications can cause eosinophilia, sometimes with rash, sometimes without rash. So we have to be careful with that. Don't forget uh, herbal supplements, many different over-the-counters and supplements could potentially be causative to classic literature described tryptophan supplements. This was some some decades back, but really there's all kinds of uh, things out that people are taking and herbal, so consider those. Travel can be pertinent, particularly when we think of parasitic disease, so we want to ask about travel not only internationally, but even uh, within the U.S., as we'll see, can be pertinent as well. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, good complete review systems to see, get a feel for any particular organ systems that may be involved uh, in the body. Basic labs that you may want to get, if not done already, probably fall within this group. Then, so probably you've got a CBC with diff already and you've calculated your total eosinophils. Um, be sure to repeat it is usually worth doing too. Don't forget lab errors can occur. Um, counts can be misread. The automated diffs sometimes do funny things. You might want to, if your lab's able to do that, double check an automated diff with a manual diff as well or at least repeat uh, your CBC with diff two, three times to, to see if there's uh, consistency. So other useful tests, just general screening, can be SED rate for inflammatory disease, total IgE might point you in some directions, as we'll, as we'll point out, but particularly might indicate uh, allergic disease. And uh, if it's a systemic scenario, then a general chem liver panel may help you to look for organ involvement. And then more detailed testing would come up depending on how your differential is uh, going from there. So how do we think about the differential? You can memorize everything. Um, you can use various acronyms um, to remember. I've used uh, this one that's a fairly old one, NAACP, that generally to me works pretty well in thinking of the key items in the differential. Um, it's not perfect, um, but gives me a guidance on the main conditions where, um, and we'll go through these one by one. So N would be anything of a neoplastic or hematological origin, so certainly thinking of the cancers, A, allergic diseases, Second A, adrenal insufficiency. This is probably overweighted here. It's not a huge cause of eosinophilia. And when it is, it's usually pretty low-grade um, eosinophilia, but just in there to, to help us to, to remember. C would be connective tissue or collagen vascular syndromes and diseases. P would be parasitic and, and other infectious agents. So this kind of categorizes our, our broad uh, secondary causes of eosinophilia, and then some patients will be idiopathic beyond that, as we'll talk about then, too. So if we start out with the neoplastic potential causes to think about, eosinophilia has been associated and reported with um, really a variety of lymphocytic-based uh, malignancies, so leukemia or lymphomas, could be of the B or T cell line, so certainly with pre-B pre cell, ALL. Uh, T-cell lymphomas and leukemias, also being a myeloid cell, if you have a myeloid-based uh, uh, neoplasm, you may have increased eosinophils as well. Then it's rare, but you can have actually an acute eosinophilic leukemia, which is, which is a rare variant of a myelomonocytic leukemia. That would be pretty rare to see if it's acute, but uh, some patients present with what's really ultimately becomes a chronic eosinophilic leukemia. And these patients were lumped into idiopathic hyperosinophilic syndrome in the past, and we'll talk about this more later, too. Now we know that in this patient group, they, they've been found to, to have an abnormal mutation that causes their disease. Um, this you should know for your board. So um, it's, a, it's a fusion of the FIP1-like one uh, gene fused with PDGFR-alpha, um, is the most common variant, so that's the platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha chain, and uh, there's, a, there's a deletion, and then those two are fused together, and that leads to proliferation from the bone marrow of abnormal and aggressive eosinophil. So based on having a mutation behind it, then it gets defined as a, as a leukemia 
but uh, sort of consider it as a subtype of, of hyperreasonabilic syndrome. So those are not too rare. So lymphomas also need to be considered, can be reported with Hodgkin's lymphomas, but also non-Hodgkin's B-cell-based lymphomas as well. So cytokine production by the abnormal tumors is thought to be the main driving factor. So if you increase your IL-3, IL-4, IL-5 production or, and or GMCSF, you may drive these NFLs then. Cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, particularly if it's part of the Cesare syndrome where they will have uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma but also um, systemic involvement often have elevated pretty high peripheral blood eosinophil levels as well. So we consider those. Here's a picture then of, uh, of a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma with a chronic lesion on the skin. Uh, no, ultimately, you want to biopsy those and, and uh, look for the lymphoma. So if we move to the allergic diseases, so as mentioned, fairly common to have mild to moderate eosinophilia with allergic diseases, but less likely to be significantly elevated above 1,500 or particularly above 5,000 would be less likely to occur. So asthma, drug allergies, the exceptions can be a severe drug allergy syndrome, particularly during the thick of things. You may have quite high EO counts, um, particularly if there's cutaneous involvement. Severe atopic dermatitis, we do know is probably going to be a hallmark, but uh, at a severe level and particularly during flare-ups, you might drive quite a high count. And then if we get to some of our more severe hyperesinophilic hypersensitivity disorders, so hypersensitivity pneumonitis, ABPA, allergic fungal sinusitis, you could potentially drive a, a high blood eosinophil count, particularly during severe times of the disease. With, say, allergic rhinitis, less likely, but possibly bad chronic rhinosinusitis or what was not kind of gone out of favor now, but NARES, non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia syndrome, that's probably a variant of chronic rhinosinusitis, you might have blood counts being high as well. Severe allergic rhinitis might bump your count up, but again, pretty Pretty rare if you're going to go above 1,500 or above 5,000 with allergic rhinitis. Food allergy without major clinical manifestations um, probably is going to be unusual unless you have chronic GI symptoms ongoing or, or, or a kind of chronic symptomatic disease. Adrenal insufficiency, as I said, probably is a little bit uh, overrepresented here. We should consider it. Um, this was actually relatively described relatively some decades ago when uh, Addison's disease, for example, was was described and found to that the blood eosinophil counts tended to run high. Probably eosinophilia alone wouldn't be the presentation. You're going to have other symptoms and lab findings, um, but consider it. Usually, if it's adrenal insufficiency, it's relatively mild eosinophilia. It's going to be un unusual to be above 1,500. The reason it's thought to be pretty simple. Basically, you have less endogenous cortisol, right? If you're adrenally insufficient, you're not making um, glucocorticoids, and so we think that. Uh, glucocorticoids endogenously kind of keeps that blood level where it is as far as what the normal range is. We know eosinophils are very sensitive to steroids and uh, so the, in a way the endogenous cortisol keeps them in check. If you have lower cortisol, your blood eosinophil levels will float a little bit higher and essentially what, what's, thought to, what's thought to happen there is it's not necessarily pathological eosinophilia. The connective tissue diseases are many, many are relatively rare, but eosinophilia has been described with the bullous, immunobullous diseases of the skin, so pemphigoid, pemphigus vulgaris, dermatitis herpetiformis. Um, certainly you'll have, you may have skin eosinophilia in your biopsies. You might have elevated uh, blood levels too. We know for chronic idiopathic urticaria or chronic spontaneous urticaria, your biopsies may show increases eosinophils, you might float a little bit higher eosinophil count, but usually mild to moderate. Um, there's some rare, rarer connective tissue disease syndromes, some of them where eosinophilia is a hallmark, so the NERD syndrome, nodules, eosinophilia dermatitis, 
rheumatism, dermatitis, and swelling. Basically, that's the acronym, um, is one where eosinophilia is part of the definition, but relatively rare. So when the skin disease, though, think about these things, uh, too. Relatively rare as a major presentation feature, but you might have eosinophilia with some of the rheumatological diseases, even severe RA or systemic sclerosis or Sjogren's, where there can be reports of elevated EOs, but not necessarily the case uh, in these patients. Probably the one to think about more so would be so vasculitis in particular, what's now called EGPA, eosinophilic granulomatosis uh, with polyangitis, EGPA, formerly known as Church strauss syndrome, where eosinophilia is a uh, hallmark feature, is one to think about. And then there are a number of rarer, quote unquote, idiopathic ones um, if it involves lymph nodes, Kimura's disease. If it involves uh, skin or subcutaneous tissues, there are various syndromes depending what's involved, paniculitis, fasciitis or Shulman syndrome, cellulitis or Wells syndrome. Um, relatively rare things, just something to be aware of in your differential diagnosis when thinking about patients. So as I mentioned, the eGPA is something you need to know about clinically and for boards can well be asked about too, so we should be familiar with it as far as diagnosis and treatment. So certainly in the differential diagnosis of eosinophilia with a variety of systemic features. And the clinical presentation is fairly heterogeneous, so we have to consider that. The pathology, if you can get it, and on a kind of textbook patient, you may get a biopsy of somewhere that shows a small vessel vasculitis that would be the hallmark then, and that could be diagnostic. Sometimes it's hard to figure out the organ to get the biopsy from, or in early cases, it's difficult to see that pathology right off. So the diagnosis, sometimes you have to make initially clinically without good findings of, of clear-cut vasculitis, or sometimes it uh, takes time to fully develop that finding on the biopsy, and you might do initial biopsy that's vague, and then several months later get a follow-up biopsy um, that then confirms the disease. So other hallmarks are as with the definition. So granulomatosis, so granulomas can form. Characteristically, there's eosinophilia. Usually it's going to be above 1,500 untreated. Um, these patients may, but not necessarily, have a positive ANCA. So a positive ANCA would support the diagnosis, but it's not always there, and there's negative ANCA patients around. So um, as you can see, 40 60% of cases could be negative too. So don't rule it out. And the organs involved can be heterogeneous. Most commonly would be lungs, so respiratory, so for sure lungs and sinus um, often involved then, and skin can be involved. Others not necessarily involved, but cardiovascular, GI system, renal, and CNS. And don't forget there's vasculitis, so you can have uh, neuropathies. You could have peripheral neuropathies. Um, you could have multi-nerve neuropathy occurring as well due to the vasculitis. And evolving in diagnostic criteria, um, the American College of Rheumatology criteria are um, to have four or more out of the six of uh, the key six features. So um, history of asthma is almost always seen, asthma meaning at least history of clinical symptoms of asthma with wheezing, cough, and so forth in greater than 95% of cases. So you're usually going to see that. Eosinophilia, they defined as 10% on the differential. 1,500 is usually the case, too. And then having a mono or polyneuropathy is a key feature. On imaging, a distinguishing feature from routine asthma would be opacities. Often they're changing from image to image over time. Um, sinus findings would be a feature too. And then, of course, the biopsy sharing the vasculitis. As I said, you may not necessarily have that, uh, but if you do find it, that, that can be one of the big six too. Won't go into too much on treatment of uh, EGPA, um, but I'll just kind of highlight it on this slide. Similar to, to our treatment of other eosinophilic diseases, so steroids are the first-line treatment. Patients may need high-dose and long-term treatment. 
in uh, the acute phase, you can add second agent of cyclophosphamide onto it. You can also do steroids plus azathioprine. You could do steroid plus cyclophosphamide, and then as they go into remission, transition over to azathioprine. Then uh, lesser used are IBIG, interferon alpha. Relatively recently, FDA approved is mepolizumab, specifically is the agent currently approved. Others are under study, some of the other monoclonals for, for reason, against eosinophilia. Um, but the mepolizumab is approved specifically for EGPA and can be used in a steroid sparing fashion at the 300 milligram subcutaneous dose monthly. So that's different than, the, than our routine asthma dose, which is 100 milligram subcutaneous. As I mentioned, some of the other agents are under study as well. Okay, moving on then to the P, which is parasites, but we'll think about really all infectious diseases. The main ones, infectious disease you'd think about are parasites, though, for eosinophilia. So parasitic infection, first and foremost. There are a few other infectious things to think about. Fungal, particularly if it's a hypersensitivity scenario with fungal infection. HIV patients. Um, and don't forget ectoparasites, so the pretty routine, but scabies, particularly if it's severe, persistent disease, you might drive a pretty high eosinophil count with those uh, scenarios, whether pediatric or adult. So those are really the main infectious ones. Generally, viruses and bacteria will not give you eosinophilia. If anything, it's thought to drive down eosinophilia. You're relatively going to increase lymphocytes or neutrophils. And so you may, if anything, see lower eosinophil counts, uh, or at least percentages, while you have a viral or bacterial. So first with the fungal diseases to think about, again, most fungal infections per se don't cause eosinophilia, um, whether they're routine sort of fungemia or localized fungal infections. The scenarios where you may would be, particularly with aspergillus, so as we know, um, more of a hypersensitivity process, but if we have ABPA or lung allergic fungal sinusitis, then due to the hypersensitivity response to the presence of the aspergillus, we can drive local as well as blood eosinophils pretty high. So think about that. Coccidioides in the right part of the countries should be suspected too. You may drive your eosinophil count up. You may have fever and respiratory symptoms. So um, we have some of that here in California, more in the inland areas that people spend some time in the desert, inland areas of California, or particularly if they get go to Arizona and the desert states, they could be exposed and come back with this. In HIV, just something to be aware of. It's unclear why eosinophilia is relatively commonly seen in HIV. Some, some will get a skin disease thought to be an eosinophilic folliculitis, so they have vague papular, uh, maculopapular rashes with uh, the eosinophilia. We don't know if this is related, something to do with the virus or not. Um, keep in mind medications, of course, if they're on medications, including antiretroviral agents, might cause eosinophilia. Um, in of itself. So as we said, infectious diseases, parasitic diseases are the most common cause really of eosinophilia worldwide, but we should think about it in the U.S. too, especially depending on travel history. The main parasites are the helminths that will cause eosinophilia. So helminths are the worms essentially. So your protozoa will not generally. So our common parasites that we think about when people go to the lake and come back with GI symptoms and may have uh, cryptosporidium, giardia, you, sh you won't see eosinophilia generally with those cases. So it's actually the helminths that we're looking for and thinking about when the eosinophil count's high. So the helminths are the worms classically, and we'll go down a quick review of uh, microbiology. I'm, I'm an allergist, not an ID doc, so I'm not a particularly expert on these, but uh, from going through differentials and giving these talks keeps me a little bit up to date on, on these guys. So you remember then, or you may not remember, but from uh, microbiology in med school, right, we have the helminths are three groups, the tapeworms, the roundworms, and the flukes the three groups there. And this you probably don't need to really remember too much about um, <clears throat> as an allergist. 
but uh, maybe just to know that the ones that can cause eosinophilia are the roundworms, nematodes, and the flukes. Those are the two, two classes. And the key is to know which ones might be seen in the U.S. for most of us, but that depends on travel, too, so we should be familiar with the others, too. And there's a lot of variation in the world. So actually, in Southeast Asia, for example, a lot of people have eosinophilia, and uh, studies, for example, this one um, done by, uh, by the NIH in the U.S. found that if you look at occult eosinophilia in Southeast Asia and what parasites do people have. So in Southeast Asia, a lot of hookworm infection and a fair amount of strongyloides is seen. So these are people, some of them don't know they really particularly have, have uh, infection or illness. So uh, they may not be diagnosed. In Africa, if you look at occult eosinophilia, it's a different pattern. It's more, the most common of them is uh, the filaria group there, schistosomiasis number two. So it depends uh, where, where have you been. If you have a patient with travel, you might do some looking up or get your ID colleagues involved to try to think what would be the, if you forget these, what would be the most common uh, parasites to look for or think about. So this one is probably a key one to think about, which are the ones that we should think about in the U.S. as far as these parasites, um, other than travel. So of course, travel, you go to Africa or Southeast Asia, you can pick up those guys. What could you catch in the U.S. would be the ones to remember. There is strongyloides in the U.S., more in the warmer and more humid climates. So the very southern states of the U.S. in general, particularly southeast, so people living there or traveling there could get exposed. Toxicara can uh, be seen in the U.S. So that's a parasite that can be in cat and dog um, feces. So that's why uh, it certainly can occur, and particularly children exposed to the feces of even cats and dogs, uh, wild or even domesticated. Ascaris is one of the larger worms, relatively rare, but there can be some in the very warmer climates, particularly southeast U.S. Hookworms, similarly, now quite rare, maybe in the uh, very southern part of the U.S. or along the border. Um, trichinella, rare in the U.S. So trichinella affects, uh, infects meat, and then uh, it's the meat that's ingested. Um, most common in other parts of the world where it may infect pork or other other mammals. In the U.S., cases that come up often are by eating wild, uh, wild uh, meat from mammals if it does come up. So those top five really the main ones we should think about for someone who's living in the U.S. that they might have. The bottom two, filaria and flukes, are non-U.S. based, so you're not going to get those. Some of those are the kind of interesting diseases, but you're not going to really get those in the U.S. unless you've traveled. But I'll go over them one by one just for a review. So a big one to remember is strongyloides for a few different reasons. Number one is that you can get it in the U.S., as we said. Number two, that it can be chronic and relatively asymptomatic. The strongyloides is a nematode. It is a, a worm. In the most endemic countries, people usually catch it from really contact, skin contact with soil. So um, countries where people may be barefoot and they're going to, the larvae of the strongyloides can get through the skin, and that's often how people are infected in the endemic areas. But if you drink uh, water or food contaminated with strongyloides or if there's uh, human uh, feces, or animal feces contamination, then you can get it orally too. And as we said, uh, one reason to think about it is it can persist. You can auto-infect strongyloides, so you can keep the life cycle going in your own body. And some patients can be relatively asymptomatic or totally asymptomatic. Some cases have been up 50 years or more of chronic infection. And also important uh, is that um, to think about this is because if you, there are cases where if you give a chronically infected patient corticosteroids, it can actually allow the strongyloides to disseminate and go into a hyper-infective state, and there are even cases of fatality from that. So uh, not sure exactly why that happens. The, presumably, uh, eosinophils and lymphocytes are keeping the parasite in check, and when you treat with steroids, you allow them to disseminate and uh, 
the patient can get quite sick. So that can be a reason to screen for strongyloides quickly in your workup, and at least if you have a low low history, low risk by history, and a negative serology, you can move ahead with steroids. If you have any suspicion of infection, you can either treat first or you can treat simultaneously along with the corticosteroids. So as I said, there is a serology available for this. Most routine labs can give you a strongyloides titer. The less common ones, we said hookworm is relatively rare in the U.S. Probably going to see it from travel. Um, the buzzwords are that you can get cutaneous larvae migrans, migrating, itchy rash where the, as the larvae migrate through the skin, and you can get uh, migration through the lungs, so you can get lung symptoms during that acute phase. And then it can go into a low grade eosinophilia as people just carry the adult worms. Toxicara, as we said, can occur in the U.S., so think about that. The, these can be acquired particularly by children if they're in, ingesting, uh, managed to ingest dirt contaminated with dog or cat feces that have uh, Toxicara. And then uh, the larvae do migrate through the skin, so you can get uh, kind of these uh, serpiginous looking skin rashes with it. Ascaris is one of the larger worms, as you can see um, in this image. Um, relatively rare in the U.S. except in the southern parts. So again, goes through a life cycle. So if you ca catch it, when you have the larvae, what happens is they will go to the, through the bloodstream to the lungs and then migrate into the lumen of the bronchi. And you get high grade eosinophilia during that time. You can have fever, cough, respiratory symptoms. And then you end up essentially coughing up the larvae, swallowing them, and then they will take host in the intestinal tract. And actually, when you have the adult worms in your GI tract, you may not have much eosinophilia, but then you might have weight loss and so forth. Trichinella, as we said, relatively rare in the U.S. unless you have people hunting and uh, eating particularly wild meat. So, uh, oops. I went to the end there. Let's go back. Okay, so wild meat, uh, seal, bear, and so forth, where it's been reported. Um, so ask a history of hunting and eating such meat. Um, trichinella, then, if you may remember, ends up going into the muscles. You get an encapsulated uh, area in the muscles um, where it uh, gets encapsulated by a fibrous sheath and connective tissue. And so you may have eosinophilia, but you may not with that uh, chronic uh, cycle of trichinosis. Filaria, rare in the U.S. <clears throat> Travel to Africa would be the most common um, scenario. And in the acute phase, you might have, again, pulmonary symptoms, eosinophilia, uh, respiratory symptoms. In the endemic countries, this is uh, the disease that causes lymphatic filariasis. And so the filaria, the urcaria, loiasis, so loa loa, you may remember. Uh, onchocerciasis being another one. So lymphatic filariasis occurs. This is where you have uh, chronic uh, disease of the lymphatics, and so uh, a lot of abnormalities in the peripheral uh, extremities, as you can see. Loa loa is the one, the kind of the interesting one for microbiology. Remember this, the larvae of this one like to go to the eye, so you may. Uh, see actually larvae migrating through the sclera of the eye. I always, always remember this one from micro um, can occur in endemic areas. Okay, so that's kind of a run through parasite memory lane. How are we going to diagnose these or, or if we suspect them maybe? So stool and P is generally the way to do it for most of the parasites. If you've got them in the GI tract, you may see them in the stool, either the actual worms or the eggs, so ova, O, and P parasites. You may need to do several samples to get a good yield, so typically it's suggested three different stool samples on three different days, and don't, don't really consider it negative unless you have three of them. 
Now, there's some parasites that won't show very well on O and P. This is where it's knowing or knowing where to look them up. So you can go to your reference or up to date and check these. The ones that you won't see on stool O and P specifically are the so strongyloides. You usually won't get a yield. So you can do a titer, as we said, for strongyloides, pretty available. You could, by bronchoscopy, look at sputum as well and actually see the bugs there. You can see the larvae in the sputum if there's acute pulmonary disease. Um, other ones that you won't see in the stool, trichinella, toxicara. Toxicara are usually zero on the O and P, so um, don't even bother, <coughs> per se, with the stool. And then some of the... So those are the main U.S. ones, so strongyloides, trichinella, toxicara. Then the... Uh, Filaria may not show, so schistosomiasis or uh, loasis or rocaria can be in the urine. You may consider that. These are going to be rare scenarios, echinococcus as well. The last three are going to be rare without foreign travel. So remember, strongyloides, trichinella, toxicara. If you're going to do titers, those are probably the key titers to look at if you want to make sure you're not missing something on the stool. All right, so finally, so these, so we went through a differential of the main five kind of exogenous causes of eosinophilia. If we reasonably exclude those with our history, physical, and labs, then we're, after remember, we have a last group, which is hyper eosinophilic syndromes. So this is where we have eosinophilia without any exogenous cause. You could lump the EGPA possibly into this group too, although I, I still leave that in the connective tissue disease parts and vasculitis. So what are these hyperesinophilic syndromes? So the definition is somewhat evolving, and I think for boards, they can't be too picky about this because it keeps slightly changing every few years. So originally we used to think uh, of it in terms of, it was called the hyperesinophilic syndrome or the idiopathic hyperesinophilic syndrome. And as with idiopathic diseases, you know, decades ago when it was described, no one knew what was going on with many patients. So they were all kind of lumped under this one term. But now we know that there are multiple variants clinically. There are biological bases for many of them. And so the term has changed now to the hyperesinophilic syndromes, recognizing that it's a constellation of heterogeneous conditions. So that's sort of the more buzzword now to use and make it a plural. You still have, may have patients where it's your idiopathic and you don't find any mutations or anything going on. So you may still call it the hyperesinophilic syndrome. You can have these other variants, so episodic angiodema with eosinophilia, formerly known as Glyke syndrome, where it's, as, as the definition, you have eosinophilia that comes and goes periodically with edema and angiodema with it. You could have just pulmonary syndromes only, so you could have only lung involvement, either acute or chronically, with blood eosinophilia, then you could call that eosinophilic pneumonia. Again, kind of a subcategory of the group. And then we know we have the eosinophilic GI diseases. They certainly are least a uh, different variant of the hyperesinophilic syndromes, with some saying it's a totally a different disease. We know that these patients, for whatever reason, get the eosinophilia predominantly in the GI tract. We know food can drive it, so it could be allergic or immunologically driven in some patients. We know that it can involve the esophagus or lower parts of the GI tract in variable proportions. Some of these patients may have just tissue eosinophilia, and so you might just separate it out and say, if it's only tissue involvement, like typical EOE, then it's just EOE. It's not a hyper eosinophilic syndrome. But some of them, particularly if it's eosinophilic gastroenteritis, eosinophilic colitis, may have quite a high eosinophil count. You might go over that 1,500 range, and you really qualify for a systemic hyperesinophilic syndrome. But then the only tissue involved is the GI tract. So a lot of overlap among some of these, and, and I wouldn't worry for boards too much on exact definitions as they're evolving. So how do we define, if we want to say hyperesinophilic syndrome, how do we define it? And it's also something that's been evolving. The latest consensus guideline document was in 2012, um, where the definition was slightly changed. So in the past, the definition required eosinophilia greater than 1,500 for at least six months 
Um, as we started to find causes in patients, mutations, and also as we started to find that patients can have significant morbidity if you don't treat them, that was thought to be a bad thing. You don't want to leave someone untreated for six months necessarily, just waiting to make a definition. So the six months was taken away, and now it's really sustained eosinophils, over 1,500, very loosely defined. Really, just you need two or more readings. The document said one month apart. So if you get a couple few readings and there's more than a month, you can meet that definition of hypereosinophilia, so EOs over 1,500. So just having the blood count high is hypereosinophilia. If you have no identifiable cause for it and organ involvement of inflammation, then you can call it hypereosinophilic syndrome. So organ involvement means there's some evidence of symptoms and or pathology by that eosinophilic inflammation. As we said, it could be one or more parts of the body involved. Um, and it could be a multi multitude of organ systems. So that's what you need for the, for the definition then. So the organs can be variable in the hyperesinophilic syndrome. It's a bit different in spectrum of what's involved than EGPA, but there is overlap. So in the series that have looked at patients, so heart, skin, GI tract, lung, CNS, renal can be involved, in, and again, in varying uh, proportions. How do we treat hyperosinophilic syndrome? So if we don't know anything about the patient, we have no mutations found and so forth, the first line is systemic steroids, but they may need chronic treatment with uh, toxic doses of the steroids. So then steroid-sparing agents come into play, and classically used have been a variety of ones, so alpha interferon, hydroxyurea. Um, really, any, any immunosuppressive agent that can affect EOs can be considered, so methotrexate, cyclosporin have been used too. A key one to know clinically and for boards, if you find that chronic eosinophilic leukemia mutation, so you can send your blood or bone marrow to look for the FIP1L1 PDG FRA mutation. Remember, that defines a specific mutation of of HES, which is typically, which is actually definite by definition of a CEL, a chronic eosinophilic leukemia. That can be important to know because then the best treatment is imatinib, or Gleevec is the trade name, right? Imatinib being a tyrosine kinase inhibitor really works well on that mutated eosinophil cell. In many cases, better than steroids, and sometimes they're steroid refractory. So if you have this variant, then the first line is considered to be to go with imatinib therapy and quick. These patients can be heterogeneous, but the markers and phenotype consists of the predominantly males and predominantly adults. They may have myeloid markers too, so you may have elevated B12. You may have ferritin, tryptase elevated too. So some of those can be things to tip you off and then look for that mutation. Agents under study are the anti-eosinophil agents. None of them are actually approved for idiopathic hyperosinophilic syndrome yet. I mentioned the mepolizumab has been approved for eGPA based on, based on a fairly comprehensive study. Um, I mentioned the mepolizumab has been studied for HES, but hasn't got FDA approval. Studies initially started with IV mepolizumab for HES um, with steroid-sparing results, but being a rare disease, not enough subjects and not a robust enough study design for the FDA to prove it. So that's still, uh, and there's still studies going on as far as the anti-IL-5s and also benralizumab anti-IL-5 receptor um, with HES. And so, uh, we don't have FDA approval um, for these agents yet, but maybe one day we will, and more guidance on doses of these and so forth that we could use. We talked about finding the FIP1L1 PDGFRA mutation, right? So as I said, that's part of a chronic eosinophilic leukemia or what's called myeloproliferative HES, so it means it's an abnormal myeloid cell line. There are some other mutations, so um, you may get hematology involved, and obviously you would if you got a bone marrow, but you may want to also look at these other fusions, um, PDGFR beta receptor uh, uh, gene or FGFR1 have been described fusing with FIP1L1. 
those are worth knowing. If you're not in that category, you don't have the mutation, you don't have the myeloid features of the high B12 and so forth, you could be lymphoproliferative, so lymphocytes are abnormal and driving the HES, then you're going to use your steroids. Or you may just be nonspecific, undifferentiated HES. Okay, so summarize then, uh, so eosinophilia, you want to consider a broad differential diagnosis, think about one of the acronyms to remember uh, the different causes if you want. Remember that if you exclude the neoplastic, allergic causes, connective tissue diseases, and parasites that uh, could be part of the hypersynabolic syndromes, then, then we want to try to subtype those out. Consider adrenal insufficiency for mild eosinophilia. All right, do we have time for any questions? Yeah, we have time. Um, anybody here in the audience have any questions for Dr. Sheikh? I, I had one. I think uh, you listed the chronic idiopathic uticaria, like there's mild to moderate eosinophilia. Is that very common with that, though? I think it's not common. I, I do you know, remember the exact studies. There have you know, been a couple of trials that have looked at eosinophil counts in the CIU patients, but yeah, um, many patients have normal range EO counts, so certainly not a hallmark in any way. Um, but you know, there's some some reports did find some uh, some patients who tend to run a little bit higher count. I don't think, and I don't know of any data that suggests there's anything therapeutically different that you would do um, for those. And I haven't seen yet certainly studies of any anti-eosinophil agents specifically for it. Perfect. Um, Javid, this is Paul Dowling. Um, the, um, I see um, eosinophilic esophagitis patients in a combined clinic with one of our GI docs, and um, I probably see um, six or seven times a year patients that have um, markedly elevated eosinophil counts, uh, well above 1,500, um, um, that, are, that have no, nothing else going on that I'm aware of, but um, but um, EOE, um, most of those patients we've done workups on couldn't find anything. Um, they've been followed by the um, oncologist, or the hematologist. To um, they have a clinic for these patients that basically have elevated numbers, and um, um, but can't, they can't find anything. They just kind of follow them periodically in a clinic. But um, the interesting thing that I see, and I was curious if you have ever seen this, is that. Um, most of these patients, um, we have a few that may persisted and elevated, but um, I see these patients and their numbers are all over the place. I had a patient um, last year that had came in, we just did a routine CBC as part of their workup, and they had an um, uh, absolute eosinophil count of 2,500. We repeated it in, um, in um, like three or four weeks, and it was, it was um, 650. Um, and then, then another time we repeated it, and it was it was 900. Then it was back down to 600. And it, I, I don't know what to do with patients like that. So, how how aggressive do you get with that? Um, yeah, that's a tricky tricky scenario. Without not much not much data on it is the hard part. Um, yeah, I specifically left out EOE in any depth because I know you have another cola lecture, at least one lecture, right on EOE in your series. Um, but with the blood eosinophilia, so it's known that many of the UE patients have normal blood eosinophilia whenever checked, and then as you mentioned, some seem to float high counts either chronically or, or even episodically. And uh, other than knowing that either scenario can occur, I don't know of any good data um, or any substantial data yet that's shown that there's any really clinical difference between those groups. So it's... Uh, it is a bit of an unknown. Of course, you know, many of these UE patients have other atopic disease, so we have to think about that being possibly the driver of some of these high reasonable counts at times. Um, but I think it's a largely an unknown. We, as I mentioned, that the we do know the eosinophilic like gastroenteritis and colitis patients tend to run often higher and chronically high blood counts. Some of that is thought to be also, in part, they have more of a deeper level of eosinophilia, even into the serosal levels of the GI tract. So then that's thought to be, you know, why is the blood eosinophil count high? 
bloody xenophil rep represents these xenophils are on the way from the bone marrow and they may be going somewhere so maybe really that that blood count is showing even for eoe it's just showing you higher xenophils that the esophagus is asking for from the bone marrow and uh, some people the blood level you know they're that's kind of their their transit is the blood and some people the levels aren't that high they just small amounts go and they go to the esophagus other patients the the transit uh, passengers there in the blood are high so I think it's really just unknown personally when the, when I've seen those I've usually if the count is high and chronically I've just pay a little more attention to any other organ systems involved in the body as far as whether history review systems and uh, some diagnostics if I'm pretty sure that nothing else is involved in the esophagus, then I've kind of done what you suggested, which is just watch and cautiously watch them and maybe even let the count float a bit. Um, over time, you may treat the esophagus. Um, I didn't, cover, didn't talk about that, but there's a lot of unknown as far as uh, patients with eosinophilia without organ involvement. What do you do with them? And the uh, NIH follows a series of patients where they have bloody xenophilia above 1,500, but no symptoms or organ involvement. And many do fine over time, even without steroids. You always worry, kind of the higher the count, the more you worry something may happen, but no magic to that. You have people with 5,000 counts who may be okay. And then people with 1,700 where they do start to get, particularly the heart involvement or, or lung involvement, which you'd worry about. Um, so I would probably, you know, mostly monitor those patients. If the count's very high in an adult, maybe we do an echo and uh, troponin and periodically do some, some uh, heart and organ labs and diagnostics over time just to make sure we're not seeing any involvement. If it's a, a younger patient or child where it's less likely and the count is relatively low grade, let's say a 750 EO count, we might watch and wait. But no right or wrong answer, really. Um, I also um, noted that uh, in August, um, Ben's, Ben Lizumab, um, all these things get harder and harder to pronounce, um, <laughs> um, got approved um, um, for as an orphan drug for EOE. Um, I was curious if you've um, had any experience using that for EOE. Yeah, not yet. It's um, yeah, it's in the orphan pathway, so there's more studies to be wrapped up with with it. Um, and uh, so, sorry for EOE specifically. Yeah, yeah. Um, which kind of I have not just personally. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm not. So more studies underway of the drug. I think it'll be interesting to see. I've not specifically, I've not been part of the trial and uh, not used it personally. I've heard of some patients secondhand that basically got on it for asthma indication and, and anecdotally EOE seemed to improve also. Um, but yeah, I haven't had any first hand yet. There's studies with methylizumab um, that they've been doing for a while now. Um, but I had known of any studies they were doing with this, but they got ap approval um, under the orphan drug because there's, there was no FDA-approved drug for EOE. I mean, we use um, swallowed steroids all the time, um, but they're not FDA-approved for that indication sort of thing. But, right. Um, so I was just curious. So. Yeah, I haven't, I have not yet. Um, as I said, there's more. There's a further study going on right now, and I think looking for more guidance on it, but I've, I've not yet, you know, primarily for EOE, had personal experience yet with it. But I think coming up, coming up, more data coming up soon. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, um, we're going to let you go. Thank you very much for taking the time from your busy schedule to talk to us, and especially it's uh, earlier out there in California. Um, so we appreciate you getting up bright and early and uh, speaking with us this morning. Have a great weekend. All right, thanks. You're welcome. You too. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you.